Another concern that we have that we have to take care of whenever we're writing our computer programs is when it comes to random access memory, RAM. So whenever we run a program, our program goes from the hard drive or from flash drive, wherever you know, this thing is stored, and it's basically put into RAM to run, you know, and everything, all the variables and everything from there on in is in our RAM so that it's, you know, the fastest, fastest access so that it can run properly. So it does feel like an unbounded amount, like my 16 gigabytes, or this computer I think has 32 gigabytes of RAM for video editing and video games and everything else that's needed. But you know, but whenever we run a program, the operating system is deciding for us how much of that RAM is being put aside for our program, and we're only allowed into that little walled garden. We can't really go outside of the bounds of that, uh, especially in the way the, the operating system is protecting that memory your program will crash real fast if you try to do something outside of those bounds. So point two here also, uh, something you'll deal with in the real world is something called a you know, memory leak. Bugs regarding memory allocation. You're like, my goodness, like there will be you know, there were plenty of times where accidental memory leaks occurred out in the real world with the video game stuff, like you know, memory, 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 you forget to delete something, and next thing you know, you're, you know, you know, you know that was always the problem. Three weeks later, the bug would come up, you, you know, the thing would crash three weeks after it started because it ran out of memory because over time you were losing memory to this memory leak. So, and then the, the final thing, uh, at least the final thing to talk about here, is that memory performance is not uniform. There's different types of RAM. There's, you know, the RAM chips that we're plugging in that the programs run off of, but there's also, you know, cache memory and different, you know, non-volatile RAM and all sorts of different types of RAM and they don't all operate at the same speeds, at the same frequencies, and the same this and the same that. And you have to, and they don't have the same amounts. Cache memory is rather limited rather than, you know, the 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM, 8 gigabytes of RAM sitting on your computer. So we have to account for that whenever we're writing a lot of our programs. So at its core, the C++ programming language offers zero protection when it comes to memory. It will let you do whatever it is that you want to do and only the operating system will stand in the way of it actually performing that operation. So this harkens back to the day where C or C++ was basically just one or one and a half steps above the assembly language that we're writing in this course. So at that time, it was pretty much presumed, oh, you know what you're doing, I'm just going to let you do whatever it is you're trying to do and just presume you know what's going on. And as has been proven many, many, many times since, is nobody knows what the heck's going on with a lot of this stuff. So we definitely need those safeguards and those protections, and a lot of the newer programming languages take that into account and just completely, for, you know, they don't allow you in to memory like C, C++, those low-level languages do. And as you could imagine, and we'll show in an example or two here in a minute, like, there could be some unintentional and very nasty bugs when you think you're doing one thing to you know something in memory, a variable or whatnot, and the reality is you're doing something completely, completely different. And pretty much the whole rest of your career will be fixing these opportunities called problems, these bugs that pop up, you know, every so often when the computer does X when you're expecting Y when it comes to the operation being performed. So here is a more concrete example of what I'm trying to talk about when it comes to memory referencing. You know, here's a subtle or not so subtle bug that will pop up you know, in when I'm dealing with an array or a structure of data. So first off, we've got to look at this and go, what am I looking at? And so the structure, struct t. So like what what is contained within that? It's contained, there's it's an integer array two sized, there's you know, two elements of integer type in this array, and then a double. And you know, the first thing you look at, and you go, well, how many bytes is this structure? And it, the question is, it depends. The, like, the question is always answered with another question, and that's what architecture am I dealing with? And in our class, you know, the, the things are going to be moving fairly soon. 64-bit architectures are absolutely the norm these days but we're still kind of programming in a 32-bit environment for the most part. But in this case, you know, an int is 32 bits of storage, or 4 bytes of storage. And in our case, a double, a float is the same size as an int, 4 bytes of storage, but a double, in our case here, is 8 bytes of storage. So if an int is 4, and an int is 4, and a double is 8, 
this guy here should be 16 total bytes of storage every time I allocate one of these structures in one of my programs. Okay, so here I've set up a, an Excel worksheet that basically shows off the 16 bytes of storage, and we won't worry about details like endianness or anything like that. Let's just take a look at our understanding of what's happening here. So I'm just set it all with zeros, because if I set up the structure, it's not how the real world works, but let's just keep it simple. And so the, the first four bytes are set aside for the, the zeroth of the first element of A, uh, the second element of A, A, A sub 1, that is the next four bytes of storage, and then the final eight bytes of storage is set aside for the double called D. So this is a for loop that's going through and just saying that I'm going to say, I'm going to pass in a value for the index of the A array that I want to, I want to modify. I want to say, oh, I want to change the, the first element to an int. Then I want to change the second element, or the third, and the fourth, and so forth, and so on, and print back whatever happens here in my, you know, whatever the double value just happens to be. So I, ne I know I need these two values here to make this work, so I went and found out what those are in 64 and 32-bit uh, binary so that we can apply this as we're going through line by line. Okay, so what we're doing in each iteration of this function called fun is I'm passing a 0, passing a 1, passing a 2, passing a 3. So I'm setting the structure, I'm setting the D value in each case to this, this binary representation. And then as you can imagine, when I'm passing in values of 0 and 1 to this function, since I want to modify the first element or the second element of the A array, that these four bytes will be modified by 0, these four bytes will be modified by 1, so the end result is the D will not be modified. 3.14 will print out in both cases. So in this case, when the 2 value is passed into this function, and you know, what does that mean? C++ will totally let me go outside the bounds of my array, so because there's only two elements that I'm supposed to be using in this case, but I'm going to, let's try the third one. So you're actually blowing out a portion of the double, and you look at the end result and you go, oh, the result goes from 3.14 to 3.13999, so forth, and you go, that's not that big a deal. Like, what are you worried about? And the reason I'm worried about this is the only reason it's anywhere close to 3.14 is because the number chosen was chosen just to kind of show you that, you know, like you can have a minor modification of the number if you kind of pick and choose what you replace those bits with. So the, the last number here is the, you know, the number f when I pass in a 3. Let me just undo real fast and just change this over here. And then you can see that by changing these bits, things get blown out and changed quite a bit more. And then in this case, my 3.139 becomes 2.000 something, a much bigger modification of the number. And again, like it's if I if I you know unexpected results will occur if I go outside the bounds of an array, especially if I start working through other bits of storage for other variables, or even or even the programming you know the program itself, the code itself has to be stored you know in binary. If you can even go into the code segment and start ruining things that way.